All right, guys, we're back here on the show floor at Gen Con 2021. I'm with studio painter Aaron Lovejoy, and we're just chatting about painting, uh, techniques, basics, um, you know, stuff that, that Brimstone players are always asking us about and, uh, and things that anybody who paints miniatures would, would love to pick Aaron's brain about. Human beings in general. Yeah, yeah. Human, if you're human, and you have a pulse and you paint some miniatures, this this is a video for you. <laughs> um, so, in our first video, we covered a lot of the real basics, you know, priming, uh, base coating, dry brushing, and uh, some of your philosophies about that. But uh, it made me think about, um, you know, the color theory of it. You right. had mentioned that a little bit when you were showing the example with the orange shirt and, uh, and that, you know, and for the tentacles, the shadows and, yeah, the, yeah, like how you're choosing the colors for the shadows, how you're choosing colors that complement each other well. And I noticed that you have this color wheel here. I do, I do. And I, I asked you about that. Handy, Tell us about dandy that. Dandy color wheel. Well, this is the real color wheel. Um, and there's a whole online course for this and everything, but the color wheel itself is out there on the internet. And, and so I like this color wheel primarily because it has all the colors <laughs> mm -hmm. so it has everything in between like from yellow to orange to red instead of just having yellow orange and red right. you have yellow and then all the stages between orange and then all the stages between red so this helps me i can actually find uh, a color a little bit easier this way because right. if i just have green i you know i get stuff from michael's or whatever and it was never the color of paints that i had it just right. was a green Sure. So this helps me look at my colors and then find what the contrasting color is. Now, okay. contrasting colors are great because you can add shadows or make shadows with, if you mix this color with that color, it makes a darker color. So, so maybe we should back up and just talk about um, how the color wheel works and what a contrasting color is. Okay. Um, well, I'm not an artist, so I don't know. <laughs> I have no clue. No. A contrasting color is the opposite side of the color wheel. Right. And those colors will look best together. Right. That's your first line of defense. You know, everyone talks about triangles and quadratic, mm -hmm. you know, all sure, these sure. different triads and all this stuff. Um, the color directly across on the color wheel is your best bet for a color that will, two colors that will look good together. Right. Um, now, obviously, if I used this color over here and this color over here, in equal amounts on a miniature, it right. probably won't look good because both of these colors are going to be competing for dominance. So you right. want to have sort of a primary and then a secondary. A secondary color. So maybe I start with this green, but I come over here to the magenta red color and I use a darker version. Of it. So how does what you're saying translate to a miniature? Grab up a miniature here and then show us what that might be. So if I grab our handy dandy little scaffold gang guy. Right. So um, let's see here. So you, you've got an orange shirt on him. Where does that fall on the color wheel? So the and then orange what does shirt that tell us about? It's definitely somewhere over here, right? Okay. Between these two colors right there, I think, is, is pretty close. Probably closer to this color. Um, I just dip my hand in the paint. That's so important to do. That works out. So we got this color right over here, right, like right there. The color directly across from it um, is more of like a bluish teal. It's kind of in the, like teal's right over here. It's just getting right up into the blue. So if we use a bluish color with our orange, we should be okay. So now, now are you talking about as a shadow color for the orange, or do you mean like as an accent? It so, could be an accent, Okay. or it could also be the shadow. Right. So if we look at, um, we tried this earlier, I have our orange here, and if I use this, uh, what was this, tentacle green? Yeah, tentacle blue. Okay. Mix that in with the orange, and now I get this really, really nice shadow color. Right. So. Technically, a complementary color will turn the color like a darker gray, but in this case, since it's not ex like the exact colors, it, it leaves it more color. So this is like a bluish dark orange. Right. And that will look really good with my orange in shadows. So when you're looking at this model, and he's got that, the orange shirt is a is a big chunk of the model. That's, right. It's a it's a pretty dominant uh, color there. Yeah. That orange. So then. You might think uh, it would be a good accent color. Like those tentacles might be the the one thing across from the orange, and so you want to use like maybe a more, more blue a, more tentacle. More of a bluer tentacle. So, what I might do in that case is I've got our I've got our uh, tentacle blue. Maybe that would be one of my main colors here on on the tentacles themselves. Would be this dark bluish color. Okay. Um, that would be very direct. Uh, we can always add a little bit more 
maybe this lighter blue as a highlight. So Yamabushi blue. So if I'm painting these tentacles and I've got Let's do a little section here. Maybe I'll grab a little bit of that lighter blue and we'll put it right at the top. Blend it in. And so for the blending, we haven't talked too much about blending yet, but you're doing it while the paint is still wet. Yes. And, and that's I, important because you end up getting a really nice gradient. Yes, you get a really nice gradient between colors. Um, it's not always perfect, but this is my base coat. I don't really care if it's completely perfectly blended. But I do get a nice transition between colors. If I say go, uh, I have too much light color up here. I want the tentacles to be darker. I can always grab a little bit more of my darker color and pull it right back up. Both sides here. That brush has seen better that, days. This brush has definitely seen better days. It's also seen better, I don't know what the heck that is. That was disgusting, Scott. <laughs> Clearly Sorry. my fault. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Okay, so. I mean, if you notice, I brought that shadow color right back up. It's still getting lighter up here, but I actually right. made it, it's a much darker, darker tentacle. Right. Now, if I'm like, no, I don't really like that, and this is where it gives me options, I can put more of the lighter color mm -hmm. and bring it right back down. So, this does in real time, it lets me adjust my miniature just like that. Right. And as you can see, those colors are looking really good together, that orange they and that blue. They actually do look pretty darn yeah. good. So That's great. Now, does that... Uh, you know, does that change anything in your mindset for, say, the gun belt? It's probably going to be in some kind of leather brown, but there's a lot of browns you could go with. You could go with a, a very dark reddish brown. You could go with a lighter tan. You could go with, uh, you know, like a traditional brown leather. I would probably, I would again remember that we have orange in this picture. And so I do a, a it could be, I'd probably go very dark belt just okay. because we've got some bright colors on here. I don't want to compete with that. Right. So maybe darker brown, like a reddish brown, but then in my highlights would all be orangish brown. Okay. And then that- And that helps tie it in with the orange shirt? Yes, and it's complementing these blue, these right. blue, I almost said trousers, these blue <laughs> tentacles, whatever. Sure. <laughs> so, so it works. Right. And that's what I'm thinking in my head. I'm always thinking of what's my contrasting color how can I work that in? Sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, mm -hmm. art, art is weird. And that sometimes, <laughs> art is weird. Sometimes blue looks good in orange, but yeah. today it doesn't. So you as an artist have to try something else. Right. But I'll tell you, 90% of the time it works. So. Well, and you know, even if, uh, if people are trying to follow like the established color scheme right. of the characters, like this is a guy where we show him and he's got, he's got green tentacles and a red shirt. Right. That's right. like what the default of the character is. Obviously, people can paint their character however they want, but what I'm saying is even if you want to follow that, there's so many greens, there's so Correct. many reds, and you can, you can like shift within that. So you know? I believe when I did, when I did the, the, uh, the studio paint job on this, mm -hmm. we had green and we had, we had green and then red, but I added tones of teal, like a bluish teal, right. into that green in spots to help complement the red a little bit better. Because right. the red was more of a warm red, which pushes your complement over the teal. So, but then that way I was able to do green, which didn't exactly complement the red, right. but it did because I had teal in it too, that right. you didn't really notice. <laughs> and these are things, I mean, it might sound complex. We have a color wheel and charts and everything. It really is the kind of thing where, you know, you can use this as a basic reference, but you kind of get that idea. I mean, right. you're probably not like scanning this color wheel 10 I times a day. I don't know, no, no. Sometimes I, sometimes I just, I just, Guess and I yeah. and I try something well, you new sort because you get a feel for it. Yes, right? yes, exactly. And the but, more you use it, then the more, the less you probably need to look at it. Right, right. Yeah. But even to this day, I'll I'll be doing something. I'm like, okay, this is a weird shade of blue. Mm -hmm. Where does it fall on the color wheel? Okay, right. what is actually, you know, the other color across from it? Right. Well, while we're talking about colors, um, you know, when people are highlighting. Right. Colors. A lot of times, you know, the general thought is you have a color, right. you know, whatever. We'll take this purple here. Yeah. So you have this uh, dark stone purple. Right. And if you want to lighten it, you add white to it Correct. and it makes it a lighter purple. You want to darken it and you add black to it. Right. The shadow black and it makes it a darker purple. So, you know, you, you uh, mix black in and that's your shadow. You mix white in and that's your highlight. But when you're doing something like say you put red into the mix here 
and you try to go uh, here we go and you try to go white to highlight it right. it suddenly becomes very very pink right and so there is a, a theory to this where you're, certain colors when you want to create a highlight you don't want to use white tell us about that correct use white use white anyway <laughs> Because so, uh, a lot of so, times if you use yellow, it'll kind of make a warmer uh, it, highlight. So so that is correct. So you you can do that. Right. Of course, now my light doesn't come out. So here's here's a little tip for when you're when you get clogged. Okay. I let my uh, dropper bottles clog. Okay. Because when you push the clog out, it just comes right back in a couple squirts later. So it, it doesn't really help. I just let it clog, and now my paints will never dry out, and I just take the paint out this way. So just put a little bit more so in my palette. you clog them on purpose. Yeah, I just, well, not on purpose, I just let it happen. I see. Because I get tired of unclogging bottles. Like, I I've see. got the little pokey tools and stuff, I, like, they just still clog. So the thing is, when you're doing something like red, red, and you've got your color here, now, obviously, if I just put white in it, like I've got white here, I get pink. And that's not really what I want for a highlight color. But if I just put a little bit of white into it, I can get a much more vibrant red right there. Okay. And that will give an optical illusion of it being like a good red highlight. So now, what you're saying is it's uh, it's not necessarily about it going to pink. It's about how pink how it pink hits. it goes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, if you were to look at like uh, pictures of Iron Man, he's got a red armor. There's a lot of parts on his armor that actually, if you did Photoshop, you know, if you use a dropper tool and you pick out that armor, the highlights on it are all pink. Oh. But you don't visualize it that way because there's not enough pink there to say that's pink armor. Okay. There's way more red. So another way of doing it is you could highlight red with pink and then come back in and make a like a glaze by basically taking your red and thinning it out and you paint that right back over that highlight and now you brought the red back in but you still have the underpainting. Kind of like we said before, sometimes you have to paint it white so that you can paint it yellow on something. Um, All right. You can, you can actually glaze that back over. Now, the other way of doing it is, obviously, you could use a little bit of yellow or orange mm -hmm. and mix that in. But then sometimes you start having orange red, and that doesn't work either. So it's, colors like red are really tricky because, because you can very easily be pink or you can very easily be orange. And so you have to be a little bit more selective in how you highlight those colors. Right. Um, like I said, a lot of times, and I know a lot of the painters do this um, on higher end pieces, they actually highlight up to white and then they glaze the red back over. Interesting. To, to get that red back, because you want it to be red, not right. pink or anything else. Right. So, it's, so you've mentioned glazes a few times. Why don't you define glazes? Okay. What do you mean when you say a glaze? <laughs> and this is funny because a lot of people have a different version of what a glaze is. Sure. But basically a glaze to me is I take my paint on the palette and start mixing water into it. So if we, if we look at this, I'll wipe my brush off. So this is completely opaque paint right there. See, it's very red. Right. This one, you can start seeing through it. I thought it was one brush full of water. If I put a second one, it gets a little bit thinner and I can keep adding brush fulls of water until it basically gets very transparent. Right. So what you want is a transparent color. This is not so much like a wash where you want it to go down in cracks. When you apply this, you just want it to go over whatever color you had down below, like which was red, highlighted to white maybe. And this will start tinting it back to red, but still let some of that show through. So that's what a glaze is. And you can do, I do glazes that are really, really thin. Like sometimes something like that, it's not even red anymore. It's just right. dirty water. This would be more for blending at the end, trying to get your blends really, really smooth. Mm -hmm. This would be more for like, I'm trying to blend between two colors. Right. So I want it to be see-through, but I also don't want to leave marks when I'm done. Would this so, also be good for tinting? When, yeah. When you just, you know, you're saying like, you know what, this is just, um, it's it's too too unsaturated. Right. I, I, want, I want to kind of pump it up a little so bit. So let's say I wanted to tint my red, my orange shirt more towards red. Or, sure. or maybe, Scott, you sent me, concept art that was red and I painted orange so it's uh, like oh so it shoot and I gotta red. I gotta turn this to sure. red so I can start taking my thinned out paint and okay. the trick to this is you want to take your your towel and kind of dab it off because you don't want you don't want the paint to go on too thickly even though it's really thin right. if it goes on thick it will leave those water marks you know the, right. like the little ring around the edges so I can go like this and I can start painting this on and start 
changing slightly the hue of this model to a, a to red, basically. And it maintains the orange. It's not like you're painting over it. Yeah. It just sort of shifts it. Yeah. So if I had had like whitish highlights up on the top here, and then I put, well, obviously we have to let that dry, but if I put this glaze over it, it will start turning that like a reddish color. Right. Because this is pure red pigment and that's white. So once I start putting that on top, you can see on this side is now starting to turn more red. And I can keep doing that. I can actually, I usually on my palette, I have several dilutions of paint. So I've got one that I can, that covers better. Right. I got one that blends a little bit better. And then this one doesn't do anything but makes my blooms buttery smooth. So it's not gonna, this one's not gonna change my color hardly at all. Um, so if I'm trying to get like the bottom of this shirt to be much more red, I can start using a thicker blend of that red. But maybe I leave the top more orangey. Right. So this allows you to, to tint things fairly well. Now, if I was at home, I would just grab my airbrush and I'd make the tint with that and spray it on. But you don't always have that. Now, if I want to tie this red shirt in with this teal, with these teal tentacles, I can start putting maybe this red tint down in the shadows. And some of this will be an experiment. You gotta put it on, let it dry, because obviously it'll get darker and, right. and not as good. But I can actually start building up a reddish undercoat under here mm -hmm. that you may or may not notice. It's sort of a complex color at that But point. it helps to tie it all in. Yes, so I have that color is the same as that color, but they're right. two different colors when I'm done. So you mentioned the complex color. Right. And, uh, you know, when you actually study paintings and you see, especially from, you know, the, the masters. Right. Um, when you see uh, something that looks like a flesh tone and you say, oh, that's somebody's face and, you, you know, it looks like a skin tone. Right. But the truth is there's such a complexity going on there. There's greens, there's mm -hmm. blues, besides the right. more fleshy tones. Um, there's surprisingly a lot of purple. Purple, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of this in your work where you bring in that complexity of color. Um, there's areas uh, where you look very closely at some of the bases uh, that you've done for Shadows of Brimstone, and you're just like, oh, it's in the mines, and it's brown. It's dirty brown uh, rocks. Yeah. But when you look really close, you have greens, you have purples, you have reds, you have flecks of white, all this stuff. And when it when it all comes together and you pull back, it's a beautiful scene. But when you when you look up close, you're thinking, how? How is he deciding on the green and the white and the speckles and the gray and the blues and all this? It's crazy. So, so where does that come from? I mean, are you are you saying I want this complexity of colors in there? I mean, or do you have a formula? How are you deciding on these things? Some of it is just that. I mean, so there's there's um, you know there's a big debate on what art is. You know, some people think art is reality. So it's like you're painting something to look exactly like it looks like in real life. I think art is taking real life and making it better. Mm -hmm. So there's a, like, like you look at a tree. Um, there were trees back in San Diego that clearly as you were driving by, you could see bright green and purple shades in this brown tree. Um, other trees look more brown, but they still have those qualities to them. So I look at things like, okay, a lot of times like on a base, I will take uh, colors from the model itself. I don't care what those colors are. If I'm lucky, they're kind of, they look, you know, natural green or right. something. But if it's purple in this shirt, I'll put purple into the base somewhere. Now, I think the more you do it, that's when you get your own artistic flavor. So you're like, mm -hmm. you know, why did you choose to put purple right there? I don't know. I just kind of felt it, you know, right. like, and then other times I'm like, I'm purposefully putting things like I strategically put rust on things, especially blue things, mm -hmm. because rust is orangey. Right. And now it, it complements the blue. It goes back to the color wheel. Yes. Nice. It complements the blue. And so I can use that rust strategically to make areas more interesting. You know, maybe they're too blue, you know? Put a little rust in there, right. you know? Now, what so, about reference? Do you actually look at either oil paintings by the masters or real photographs, you know, like I, reference from nature? Yeah, or? I kind of, a little bit all of the above. I'm, I'm not super, it's funny, I'm not super interested in going to a museum and looking at art. I am super interested in coming to a Gen Con and looking at the paint contest because right. that's the art I like, you know? Right. But I look at a lot of that stuff. Um, I, I watch YouTube, I watch strange YouTube videos. Like there's this guy, Mural Joe, that does murals with a big frazy paintbrush and he makes, his color theory is so spot on, it's amazing. Does everything with house paint. Wow. 
And it's it's amazing. He talks about how he colors his shadows and why he does some purple and some blue and some you know whatever. Right. Um, I like watching uh, videos on uh, like Photoshop art. Mm -hmm. So if you watch someone do like Photoshopping non-metallic metal like a Gundam or something, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because the way they Photoshop it is almost the exactly way, same way you would paint it in real life. Right. Right. So looking at, at references like that really help. But then also you just start getting a feel for what looks cool. You know, there's the rule of cool too. There's reality the rule and then of cool. there's the rule of cool. So maybe we're sitting here and like the back of our shirts will look really cool with a bright teal back, you know, mm -hmm. backdrop or backlighting. Okay, well let's try it. Let's see what it looks like. Right. So what you're um, saying is it's fantastical. It doesn't have to be realistic. The, no, and that so can, I mean we all know what real looks like. The sure. trick is to make it look real enough and then right. make it better than that. So a hyper real. Hyper real, yeah. Okay. All like right. for instance, the Otakuro is just a big it's just a big skeleton. Right. Like I remember I got it and I'm like, this is a freaking cool model. He's all bone. You know, he's right. got a shirt on, but who cares? He's mostly bone. Like, how do you make that interesting? And so this and, is where you underlit it? Yeah. So then I, I was like, well, he, there's some sort of magic that obviously, you know, right. I mean, right. I haven't seen any bones walking around, but um, so I thought, what if instead of it being like a, a light source where it's glowing on the ground, it's actually him just emitting sort of that spectral, right. so you know, a little it's bit trailing ethereal. off. And so I was magic. able to do backlighting sure. on, you know, the eyes, the hands, mm -hmm. down on the, on the clothing and stuff, mm -hmm. but you don't see any of that on the ground. Right. It's just, right. It's, just, it's just light enough for you to barely see it, but it also set the model off and made it more interesting, I think. Right, know? right. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, the Otakuro turned out so good. Everybody and everybody always comments on the underlighting and everything. I love it, especially because he's like this. So all the photos I have, I'm always putting him so he's grabbing somebody. Or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and and we've seen that from you consistently with the paint jobs that you've done for the brimstone stuff. I remember when, um, you know, we gave you the nun. Yeah. And we it, when it came back, I mean, everyone knows nuns are wearing black, black and yeah, white. Yeah, there's nothing exciting about it. it at all. And yours <laughs> came back and you added red in portions of her outfit. And at first I was like, what's he doing? Yeah. He's, he made part of it red. And then I was like, wait, it looks really good. <laughs> and it's kind of what you're talking about. It's it's a reality, but then adding that twist there's, to make it more interesting Just a visually. little bit. I, yeah. You know, oftentimes people ask me, so when I add a, a contrasting color to something, I call it a kicker color. A kicker. And it, it's funny, I started calling it that, and then I found out it actually is a term that photographers use uh, really? for adding like a backlighting or some sort of color that makes kicks, it pop. Yeah, makes things pop. Yeah. So kicker colors typically are that contrasting color. Right. So if I have a blue robe, I might actually put some orange in it somewhere. Usually in the shadows, which is weird, still reads as a shadow though. Right. It's just orange on right. a blue robe. And um, so people always ask me, like, where do you know, how do you know when to put that in? Right. And my answer to that is, well, anywhere it looks boring, or I start getting tired of blue, right. I just throw some in. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a shadow, it could be in a midtone, it could be in the highlight. Right. It's just, it just changes up that area just enough for you to go, it's blue, but it looks cool, you know? Right, right. right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we talked earlier about how your brush had seen better days, and it, it reminded me we should talk about brushes. That's brushes, thing brushes that would, be, uh, are, would be great. I've I've actually got some brushes here, um, and so this one right here is. Maybe a, we should move the palette. Yeah, let's move the palette. You can see uh, a little bit better with a white background. All right. So I've got a couple different dry brushes. This one's from Monument Hobbies. This one's from Morphe. Um, this one's a makeup brush. Um, I actually like the makeup brushes the best. They're super, super soft. And when you say makeup brush, it's literally a brush that was made for applying yeah, I makeup. I stole them from my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, then, and so that's and, kind of a secret then. Yeah. The, um, the notion that you can use makeup brushes as dry brushes. And I don't it sounds know, like they're great. I don't know why they work better. I mean, they're super soft, but then the ones you get at craft stores are super soft too. There's something right. about these brushes. They just work better for dry brushing. Okay. And I found that the bigger ones work even better. Now, obviously, sometimes you can't like dry brush a small face or something, but for dry brushing big models and stuff, this works great. Um, so that was that was a big breakthrough for me, like recently, right. within the last two years. So now, when uh, when when you say dry brushing, right? Uh, dry brushing can actually be done with almost any brush. It's yes. about the technique of putting on paint wiping off most of the paint right. and then rubbing the brush back and I've forth. I've actually dry brushed with this brush before. Really? Yeah, because I mean sometimes you just need to get in a little a spot little, just a little and just bit. 
barely touching it. But um, it's important to note that you know while the act of dry brushing is putting on paint, wiping it off, and then rubbing it against uh, you know back and forth across the surface to pick up highlights. Right. Um, certain brushes lend themselves themselves better yeah. to dry brushing. They tend to be uh, usually. Um, more blunt ended right and a little stiffer and a little bit stiffer yeah. and so uh but uh, talk about that for a second like you said that you did use this brush for dry brushing right. how, how do you determine you know what what sort of cases do you want to use a big blunt dry brush and what sort of cases do you want to use a normal brush i'm not saying something this yeah, small yeah. but like a like normal this one. brush like sure. this one so so like one here, thing compare these yeah. two one thing, these ones are literally the same size. No, okay, they're, um, they're definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one thing you gotta remember is when you're dry brushing, you're being more rough on your brushes. Okay. So using a, a nice Klinsky Sable brush that costs a lot of money is gonna wreck that brush. Okay. You know? So you have to be really gentle. So something like this model, this okay. Belial, um, I've actually, I airbrushed it first, but then I've been dry brushing on highlights. Um, okay. This is from my own personal game. So. Um, but this works great because you're just motoring around, you know, none of these details are so small. I don't have to get right in the armpit and get just a little bit, right. so, which I couldn't do with this. But if I needed to, maybe I switch to this brush and just barely hit that area right there. So that would be a reason to go to a smaller brush. Smaller uh, brush to sort of get in there and get in certain places. Yeah, so like... Also the uh, amount of space, surface area that needs to be covered. Exactly, okay. and Belial, like, um, there's actually details down in here. Yeah. And if I want to paint this, if I'm just doing this for gaming, maybe I don't care about that because nobody's sure. going to look. But if I want to take my time and actually get some under reflections in here, maybe I come in and I dry brush those areas too. Right. And that will help do that. Now this would also work kind of on like this guy's face. Right. Now you got to be really, at this point you're being really gentle and you're getting most of your paint off, but you can actually get in there and just lightly dry brush his face. Right. So. Um, obviously, if that doesn't work, I don't have any flat brushes on me, but they have those chisel brushes. Right. Those ones are great for faces because they're thinner. They're thick like that, but they're thin this way, so you can go sideways right. and hit a smaller area. So those would be the reasons I would switch between you know bigger and smaller brushes. Sure. All of these brushes are synthetic mm -hmm. um, hairs, and like I said, this one's super soft, but it still has it's still tough. Like. There's some there's some pushback when I'm when I'm dry yeah. brushing, um, you know this brush is this brush is great because it's great for base coating but then it also dry brushes fantastically. Sure. So if you're doing a base, that's another part. You got to get in right there to get some highlights on your rocks. Right. It helps to have a smaller brush to get in there and do that. So. So I mean, and a good uh, rule of thumb for for brushes that aren't a specialty type like a dry brush. Right. If you just have a, a normal you know standard brush. They're different sizes. Yeah. Um, you know, smaller brushes work for finer detail. Yeah. Larger brushes kind of give you a big base coat, that right. kind of thing. Um, but let's talk about because I mean, we could spend two hours just talking about brushes. Why don't we talk for a second about if someone's beginning, what would you recommend if they had like say three or four brushes in their in their toolbox? In their arsenal. What What would you want to get as a good kind of base? You know, to get you started. Right. So I would definitely have a big dry brush like this. Okay. I think these are like five bucks and they're, they're nothing. So okay. super good. Get it on eBay. Um, I like these big uh, hobby brushes. Okay. Um, and this is a this is a size eight. Um, it's huge, but uh, and it's nylon. So it's a it's a synthetic hair brush. Okay. The synthetic hairs tend to put paint on more evenly. Okay. So you get an even base coat as opposed to like a Klinsky sable which will put the paint on it and be a little bit blotchy. Interesting. So if you're trying to just motor through and get stuff, you know, painted and on the table, mm -hmm. if you got to put three layers on just to get the orange orange, right. it takes a long time. Okay. If I can do it in one layer and maybe do a couple touch-ups, I'm right. much better with that. Also, this brush holds a lot of paint. I can paint this entire shirt with one brush layer. Interesting. So that's really nice. Okay. Um, they, they this is kind of an older one so the tip is kind of messed up right now but when they come they're more like this and they've got a they've got a fine tip so you can actually get in and start doing details like the face with this huge brush yeah so my rule of thumb is get a bigger brush with a good fine tip on it right um, you don't want it it doesn't need to be super long or anything but it's got to have a good tip on it and it's good if it's nylon 
So I found that uh, sometimes the tips of my brushes will start to bend. Right. It just bends at the tip. Is when that happens, is it done? You um, just get rid it of usually it turns you... into my dry brush. Yeah. It could be a dry brush. Um, I have actually. So I know exactly what you're talking. It does that little curl. Yep. Um, and yeah, it, it sucks because you go to paint this thing and it paints over there. Right. But what if you needed to paint a little highlight up on the top? I've actually used that, like have the curl and just go right around the edge and, and use it as a highlight. Right. Um, you can still use those brushes. It's not optimal, but. Sure. Now the other thing is, I talked earlier about doing dry brushing from different angles. Right. To get a texture. Right. That brush now has like weird hairs on it. So if you use it as a dry brush, you wipe it off and you start dry brushing, you've got these weird hairs that are going in different directions. And that can be a, It can a be thing. really cool, sure. yeah. So I always tell people, pay attention while you're painting, watch sure. what's happening, because even a mistake can turn into your best asset, you know? So to finish the thought about like the choosing just three or four brushes, right. you have the big dry brush. Big dry brush. You've got I would have a big hobby brush. Big hobby brush. Okay. Um, you definitely want a smaller like detail brush. So like this is a size one. Um, I think this one's uh, synthetic as well. So that, that starts getting you some, some details. Right. But you always want to have uh, what they call a Klinsky sable. Okay. And this is a brush that's it's like a rat hair from Russia, basically. Okay. And they're the best paint brushes. Like everyone's tried everything, this is the best. Okay. Um, now obviously like a paintbrush is kind of very a personal thing. So you may find, uh, like, there's all different brands. But you um, feel like if you had this kit right here, these four brushes, yeah, these, you could paint I could paint just, just about, about anything. anything. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. All right, let's talk for just a second about the numbers. You've been throwing out numbers here. Right. Did you want to explain kind of the gauges of brushes, the, the number system? Yeah, well, so that's different with every brand. Like, this is a size 6, and it's bigger than the size 8. So Okay. So it, it's not standardized across the board. It's not standardized across the board. But generally speaking. This one's a size one, and I think this one's a size one. So generally speaking. It's a huge speaking, difference. Uh, the, the, the smaller the number, the finer the, the brush. Correct, correct. The finer the point, the smaller yeah. the brush. Yeah. And then you get to zero, which is even smaller, and then you can go. Um, you can go multi zeros, right? Yeah. Uh, this one's a zero, too. So you can almost see the difference in size of brushes just within different manufacturers. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have any. I usually don't go smaller than size zero. Okay. And the reason for this is is your brush needs to have moisture in it. We're using acrylic paint that dries with air. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you get like a, a, like they call them odd size brushes, so a triple zero mm -hmm. or a quadruple zero, the amount of area that you can hold moisture in your brush is very, very small. Right. So you'll grab paint off your palette and it will dry before you can get to the model. Ah, That's a pain in the butt. Right. Those types of brushes work really well with washes. Like you guys have right. the, um, the ink washes that you have. Yeah. Um, and that this, the really small brushes work well on this for doing like pin lining, you know, if you're just outlining parts on your model. Right. Because right, right. that paint doesn't dry as quickly. So what I say is get a bigger brush with a really fine tip. Mm -hmm. That way your, the belly of the brush holds more moisture in it right. and it will keep your paint wet longer. Interesting. So even if you haven't thinned your paint at all, there's a little bit of moisture in your brush and that will keep it moving and grooving as you paint. Nice. All right, so, well, you know what? Maybe we should wrap this one up here. We'll, yeah. we'll do another video and, and talk about other stuff if we have a chance during the show here. Cool, cool. Uh, but thanks again for uh, for kind of answering these questions yeah. and going through yeah. it. Asked all the questions I'm super passionate about, so. All right, well, excellent, that's great. And uh, and as a reminder for anybody who didn't see the first video, uh, Aaron has a setup called Miniature Monthly, where he and some other award-winning artists, he's award-winning, believe me, he's won every award. Couple. And, uh, and these guys, they will teach you how to paint like nobody's business. Yeah. And, and not only amazing, um, you know, videos that you get access to, but also uh, you can get one-on-one -on -one training and, and special coaching and stuff like that. And, and I've seen the results. People have, um, you know, our, our Brimstone players have gone from, I've never painted a miniature to winning contests. Yeah, doing pretty and good. So it which is a great amazing. feeling, you know. Absolutely. They're doing it in a lot faster time than I ever did it, so. <laughs> yeah, well you can stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. They, they, they get so much better so much faster because because they're, they're learning what you know. I, I like the feeling, I know a lot of, painters and artists and stuff that 
they have it in their head what they want to do. They just right. physically can't do it. And there's so many things to be aggravating in our hobby. Right. Just in learning how to make the paint work. Once you learn those things, all that stuff that's in your head, all those ideas can come out. It just and that's a unlocked. great feeling. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again, guys, for joining us. For uh, It's all part of our coverage of Gen Con 2021 here at the Flying Frog booth. Once again, we're at booth number 707. So if you're here at the show, come by, say hi, uh, play in a game, participate in the paint and take, meet Aaron, pick his brain yourself, get some, uh, some good tips, and check out all the sales and specials we have going. If you guys are watching from home, uh, we do have games going throughout Gen Con online and, uh, and also a big Gen Con sale on the web store. So uh, hopefully, in one way or another, you're getting to celebrate Gen Con with us. Best four days in gaming. Bye, everybody.